Big Gab, episode 350 for Monday, July 18th, 2022. folks and welcome to or welcome back to gig gab the show by for and about working musicians here right off of a fling rehearsal in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here i think in napomo california it's paul kent <laughs> yeah you've been all over the place man haven't you i tell you man that you know i started this new day job and it's been a blur of like working a full day and then get my butt to a, to a gig or something like that. It's been something I haven't had to do in so long where like the schedules stack on top of each other. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a trip. I've had um, solo gigs. I've had a duo gig. I've had several house rocker gigs. I had a trio gig, you know, both in Northern California and down here. It has just been a blur, but I do have some good to share that the house rockers seem to have clicked into another level lately. We've had some really big high profile gigs Yep, and I don't know what it is. You know, maybe it's just finally with the new guys and the old guys where, you know, we've hit that spot and things are just grooving. We've had some great, great gigs lately that are, you know, really fun, really, really fun. That's great. So, yeah, I think last time, I can't remember if I expressed it on the show, but certainly pre-show, I was kind of like in a malaise, like, uh, you know, it's not what it was, you know, it's, it's music's kind of letting me down lately, but then you have... When you're when your guys are your guys or girls, yep. uh, and and you know it's great and people are loving it and it's fun and it's soul filling, all the bad stuff just melts away in a second. It does, yeah. I am I am super fortunate right now to be playing in two bands where I feel exactly that for different reasons. Um, you know, Bitter Pill, we're really it, that band is like happening in a, in a lot of different ways, and you know this new record that we just put out. I'm really stoked about it. Living ain't cheap, dying ain't free. I'll put a link in the show notes. You can you can find it on uh, all the streamers, or you can buy it from us, or you know whatever you want. But um, and we make more money if you if you buy it from us, obviously, <laughs> because because we know all know how the streaming thing works. But but listen anywhere. Just like we're I'm stoked to have this music out there. Everybody on this show Great. has heard the thank you. It has heard the you know the. The, the process that we've gone through and it's actually you've heard maybe 30 percent of the process here. There's been there's been more because there's always angst and, you know, all that stuff is you have this thing that you poured your heart into and, and then it finally comes to see the light of day. And there's you know, there's always a lot of care that goes into that, which has been great. Yep. yep. Um, and then, you know, the gigs have been great. Bitter Pills I, like really firing on all cylinders. I'm, I'm stoked about all the gigs we've got coming up. And then I just, like I said, I just have finished a fling rehearsal literally, you know, 20 minutes ago, just before we recorded this. And, uh, it was just four of, of us, Aaron, our keyboard player who often cannot make it to rehearsals cause he lives so far away now, uh, was not here, but the four of us, you know, with Jamie, Jamie Bradley on bass, it, it really it, like things, we all have the same goal. Uh, things are really tight in that band, you know, the whole kind of power pop ethos, all the songs, most of the songs actually fit into that power pop realm. Some of them might not, but we kind of have that same, you know, the songs, let's tighten them up. Let's get the harmonies tight. Let's get everything right in place. And and let's just, you know, precision. There's a, there's a level of precision and, and, and looseness, like at the same time that that's happening that's there. Yeah, it's it. I, I was. We were all kind of noticing it during rehearsal tonight. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, this is good. This is good. So, yeah, you know what? I'll actually say. We'll, I want to talk about this a little bit more in a bit. But yeah. what you're saying about everybody on the same page, that is the opposite of the concept that being in a band is an exercise in compromise. Compromise implies that people have different pages. That you know, you can have a, a little bit of your page. Sure. Right. But not all of it, because I got to get to my page, right? Whereas opposed to if every, I think that's the most powerful thing that gives a band lift is like everybody on a common mission, not a common mission, we're going to be the best band in town or common mission, like, you know, it's, you know, we're going to be the best musicians in town or anything like that. But literally, if you broadly define everyone being on the same page to accomplish the same goals, what those goals are, I think that's more important than musicianship, more important than, you know, 
jeans versus cargo shorts, you know, a, a million ways <laughs> to slice it. Yeah. I actually think that's the thing. And if your band is not on that and you're compromising, yeah, you can make it work and you can have some success. But I would posit that a unified approach to, to, to you know, band growth, band success is probably one of the most powerful motiva- motivating things that you can achieve. It does. It, 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 I agree with you. And it doesn't have to be everyone's vision either. In fact, rarely will it be that it, it, it might be just one person's vision in the band, but as long as everybody is eager to serve that vision, whether, you know, regardless of the genesis of that vision, but if everyone is eager to serve it in that band, that's the key. It doesn't matter how you get there. Well, it changes over time too, because oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Serve, serving that vision Maybe the one guy has had a vision and explained it so clearly that you can set aside your, you know, needs because you realize that a guy who's that on fire yep. is going to take you places, right? And some people yeah. are wired that way. Yes. Some people are wired like, uh, you know, I joined a band because I want to move forward. Tell me where you point me in the right direction and I'm there for you. I think that that's all part of it. I, I told you the story about the house rockers many times, like. I started it thinking the best thing to do was to do something different. So I put together a horn band that played New Jersey Shore covers <laughs> right, in right. Northern California. And while it was fun for me to do a couple of times, clearly the connection was happening. My my thought was it really doesn't matter what type of music you play. You could play polka music or you know anything. If you perform it with energy and joy, you know, it will go over. And I found in the cover scene, if you wanted to book you know, gigs and get a following, you know, the more familiar, um, you know, would serve that. So then, you know, we started to adapt. And then I brought in a guy who was a really passionate, powerful funk soul guy, music I had no interest in playing. And it took me a long time to adapt to what I really wanted was a good band that was, that was loved and moving forward all the time. Sure. And, and I found a way to make it okay in my head and Yep. That my vision of perfect repertoire and, and artistic, you know, showing people how smart I was, was not was not as important as actually just being part of a great unit that achieved things together. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I'm, I'm, I'm routinely in these conversations. I'm routinely minded, reminded of the comment Joe Walsh made in that Eagles movie. And and, you know, I, I always couch it as saying, look, you know, Joe Walsh came into the Eagles with his own street cred, like he had his own bands. He had his like he was a, a household name and he came into the Eagles and said, whatever is best for the Eagles. I go with what Don and Glenn say, because that's going to be best for the Eagles. It's like, wow, Joe Walsh, Mr. Ego, you know, coming in and being able to see that and say that like that's key. Because it, it always goes back to that thing about, you know, what's a pro. <laughs> what's a pro. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's interesting. Hey, I got to play with a new little uh, thing from Personas. It's called their Audio Box Go. And it's a it's a little uh, uh, audio interface. Two channels in, two channels out. It, the The two channels in both have quarter inch and one of them has a combo jack. So you can do quarter inch or XLR. It's got phantom power in it if you want. It's got two uh, outputs, which you can also um, play as a stereo output into headphones. It's got 50 dB of gain, and it's bus-powered, which means you don't need a power supply. You just plug it into you know whatever device is, is running it, so your laptop or um, your iPad or whatever. And, I, like, this thing's got the, the mic preamp on this thing. It's a Personas preamp, and it sounds... It's a really musical preamp. I tried it with some challenging microphones, some dynamic mics, like the high LPR 40 that I've, I've used on this show sometimes that needs a lot of gain in order to really sparkle and shine. And it sounded great. It's a, it's easy to use. It's small. And the, I love being bus powered because it means, you don't you, you don't, if your laptop's charged, no. you don't even need a power supply, right? You're just good to go. You can kind of record. It's and, truly, truly mobile recording. Right? Yeah, it, it is. I mean, it's only two channels. So, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to do crazy things, but, um, but yeah, it is truly mobile recording. Yeah. It's really, it's a, it's a well done, simple piece of gear. Uh, that, it, you know, I should have pulled that up. I will, I will find this as we talk and I vamp here. Um, and is, um, 70, 80 bucks. Personas, 
at oh 80 bucks God. at Sweetwater. It's a, MSRP is a hundred and so you can get it for 80 bucks at Sweetwater. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, and is it marketed personas or uh, as Fender? No, it's personas. It's, it's the, Persona. I didn't know if they were keeping that line. Yeah. Yeah. Personas audio box go. Yeah. 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 So, I, you know, I, I have the, uh, universal audio bus powered one, which was supposed to be the, is supposed to be the top of the line. Sure. And again, it's a, it's a bit of a different ball. That's, game a, that's a whole different with, ball game. That's right. Yes. <laughs> well, it, it sort of is a different ball game, you know, with the built in DSPs right, right. and the whole architecture about, about the plugins that they have. Although, yeah, I guess it is what you want to record, how you want to record and when you want to record. I know with that. You know, there there are several of their plugins that don't work on the amount of DSP power that's on the on the box that I bought. Right? Yeah, that's the that's so the that limited was, box. You need like four of those shark processors in it or whatever right. to to get yeah to really make right. that thing sing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it was five hundred dollars. And again, you know the yeah. the basic the basic premise there is that processing via DSP in the in the audio interface guarantees le less latency and you know they've got some cool plugins that are you know pretty cool sure. but a lot of the plugins run you know native in in logic or, or pro tools as well yep. so you can actually get the value of what those what those plugins do by placing them a different place in the chain but i don't know 80 bucks i mean that yeah i mean i'm not saying that that it's apples to apples no it's but if not it's just mobile recording thing that you want to do and getting something recorded wherever you want to go that's a pretty pretty attractive price and you've got that sonos pre uh, sonos oh, gosh here i am it's late it's a pre sonos preamp not a sonos preamp I, I don't know that i've ever seen a sonos preamp for a microphone uh, who knows maybe they've made one that we've never seen but uh <laughs> I don't but think the, so. the, the probably not yeah the uh the personas preamp I, I mean, that's what I'm using here, right? I've got the Quantum 2626, the Thunderbolt interface that I use for in the studio here for fling rehearsal and for this show. And I, I've i really come to like the way these preamps, um, they just, they're, they're easy to use. They've got tons of gain and yeah, it's, and like you said, 80 bucks. So yeah, mm. it's good. Um, I found a little, I have a tip to share, Paul. And I feel like a fool for not having done this 10 years ago. And my tip is simple, folks. If you are the, the one in your band in charge of sound, and, and you could be the sound engineer or you could be, you know, one of the musicians in the band that also is in charge of sound uh, like I am, teach the band the input list. In fact, I went as far as printing out a sheet that lists what instrument, you know, which vocal mic, which instrument, whatever goes into which channel on the board. It has made my life during setup so much easier because it used to be, and this was true when Fling was like, you know, planned six gigs a month or whatever, the guys would hand me their inputs and tell me what it was and I would plug it into the board. But it meant I had to mm. like be near the board. I, I, I can't. I, and so I did it with Bitter Pill. Uh, I don't think I did it last summer. I think I started it earlier this year. And as soon as I did it, it was like, oh, right. Like, I mean, of course everybody can plug things in if they're told where to plug it in. <laughs> you know, it's, well, it's, we actually have a, we actually have it better. So Bill plugs everything in right? and then everybody who mixes themselves, you know, via a app and yeah. all the inputs on the app are labeled. And so we have it solved from the user interface part of it. Well, yeah, but Bill still has to plug everything in. Right. Whereas, oh, yeah. whereas with this, you know, I just print it out and people wire up their cables for their amps or their microphones for their vocals and they just go plug. And that, you know, by the time it's time for me to go and, Tune the PA, everything's plugged in and we're good to go. It's real. It, it, I, I know it sounds stupid and simple because it is. And that's what makes it beautiful. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I feel foolish for not having printed that list 10 years ago. But, you know, we live, we learn. Live and learn. Live and, and learn. Um, along similar lines, but not quite the same, maybe along the lines of what you were saying there, uh, Andy wrote in, to feedback at giggabpodcast.com and says, um, Dave, when you're using in-ears and ask for and get a line feed for your own in-ears, uh, regardless of the rest of the stage monitors, uh, do you do you just have to take the mix you're getting from the house? Or he says you can adjust the volume with your monitor amp, but the mix itself is not under your control. Am I correct? Or if I'm not, let me know how you do your own mix. So... The idea is you get this feed from the house. Yeah, you know, I get to a gig. Somebody else is running. It's a house sound. I ask nicely, negotiate my way into getting a feed. XLR, quarter inch. I don't care. I have the right cables. I plug it in. 
I'm good. What is that feed? So more often than not, I'm getting a separate aux send from the board. So theoretically, the mix can be tailored and customized to me and me alone. The trick, of course, is whether or not the engineer is going to give me access like via a wireless, you know, if he'll give me the password for the mixer, the, the Wi-Fi so I can do it myself, or if it needs to be done by the engineer at the board. More often than not, lately, they haven't had iPad access on the boards, which is weird. Or the engineer has been a little bit iffy about just giving it to someone that, you know, some unknown drummer off the street. So uh, where it's the latter, I know what I want. And I can communicate it very, very quickly. I, I have one sentence and I say, give me all the vocals at the same level and then give me all the instruments 2 dB below that. And that is a great. So learning that and being able to communicate that efficiently is kind of the key in those scenarios. And then what I do, because I use that uh, Rolls box, I use the PM50 from Rolls. It has two inputs on it and one and two outputs. The out, one of the outputs goes to my ears. One of the inputs is from the board. Now, what are the other two you ask? It's a microphone pass through. What that lets me do is I can plug my vocal mic into the, my box and then out from that goes to the board. And the engineer generally doesn't even know. I say, uh, you know, I'm going to use my own mic stand because I have my own mic stand uh, built into mm -hmm. my drum rack. And uh, I say, just give me the XLR. I'll plug it in. But I don't plug it directly into my mic. I plug my cable into my mic. I plug that into the the uh, monitor amp. And then from there, I go out. So they get a pass through of that. And it's 100% theirs. Nothing I do can change what's happening to their levels for front of house. And they'll even give me some of that back because I've asked them to give me all the vocals at the same level. If I want more of me, I have a secret knob that I can turn mid gig. No one else needs to know. And I can add more of me if I need more of my vocal. Generally speaking, I actually like to have more of other people's vocals than me, but sometimes it doesn't quite work that way. And, you know, I need a little more of me or whatever. But, all right. So uh, one, one more time, I'll ask the magic question I ask. Is, yeah, man. You know, to me, and again, I've used only in-ears just about every gig. Yeah. This summer. Um, and the first big thing that we solved is one of the stupid, like talk about live and learn <laughs> was when it was, it's, it's those things where there's no sweet spot of control that I have. It's either right. too low or too loud. And that's because the send from the, you know, the receiver or the, uh, or the, the, from the, the board. distribution box. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, from my box, the send from the wireless, uh, it's not a receiver. It's the other end of it, right? You know, you have the you would have the receiver, yeah, because the transmitter would be be sending to you, and then you have your belt pack. Transmitter. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So the transmitter, you know, the send was too high. So once I finally realized that most of my problems with oh. uh, with sweet spot was just because nobody was looking, I wasn't looking, Bill wasn't looking at what the send coming out from there. So that solved. Oh, so you were getting all kinds of distortion in the transmitter. Right. Oh, of right. course you were having a problem. Ah, uh, right? <laughs> I had no again, idea. Li live and learn. Oh, man. Live and learn. Anyway, but then the, the other thing is, again, when in the situation you're describing, what do you do when someone is has a propensity for turning up over the course of a gig or hitting harder over the course of a gig or or getting vocal fatigue and being too soft over the course? Like, what do you do for the, di for the dynamics that are inevitable that are physical problems, not necessarily electrical. Problems. I don't, I, I, I don't, I, I certainly am aware of those things and they happen. And sometimes, yeah, you know, a guitar will get louder during the gig or, you know, whatever. Um, but it's generally not so bad that it actually changes my ability to hear what I need to hear to play. Um, mm. Yeah. It's, it's not awful. Now, one of the things yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, it, it's 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 usually not an issue. Um, I mean, look, if I have iPad control of of my mix, either because it's my mixer or because I have a relationship with the engineer such that that's what I have, I'll likely be changing things. I'll probably make 10 changes to my mix throughout the night. You know, if I'm playing like a two set night or something, you know, there's just little tweaks. I'll notice. Oh, yeah, the guitar's a little low or a little loud or whatever. I'll tweak that. I, I would love to have a little more bass, you know, like those picky things. I'll, obvious. If I have the ability, I will make those changes. No question. But if I don't have the ability, I will only ask the engineer to make a change if it's so bad that I can't 
here are my reference points to do what I need to do. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, and, and so it really, it's it, generally speaking, the engineer is going to run their gains the way they need to for front of house. And as long as I have all the instruments at the same, you know, level and, and sitting just hair below the vocals, that's enough for me. And if the guitar gets a little too loud and maybe the guitar during guitar solos is as loud as a vocal, well, that's fine. You know, chances are I, I'm not needing to sing and blend harmonies at the same time that a guitar solo is happening. So it's like, yeah, it's fine. You know, whatever. And so, yeah, it's just not that big of a deal. I, actually, my question would go back to you. Now that you've solved this distortion and it's in, you know, a lot of things come with distortion. You were getting effective compression, right? And limiting happening. So all the sound was just getting mashed together. Now that you've, you've given yourself more headroom, how much of an issue is it when somebody, you know, when you get volume creep from someone, you know, throughout the gig, is it, does it change it as dramatically as it was before? Or is it just one of those things where you're like, eh, all right, well, next time, maybe I'll take a little less of that instrument, whatever it is. Uh, the answer has a few links to it. So one sure. is when it's right, it's such a pleasant experience. Well, yeah. And when it's less than right, it's frustrating. Not, not game changing. Stop the gig. Sure. You know, give me a wedge. Right. But it's like, oh, uh, right. So yep. it's, it's, it's less than good when you know when it can be good. Yeah. And I have that um, too. I mean, for sure. It's like, it, you know, it's, you're, you're going to get through. It's going to be fine. And I guess the way. I guess the way I look at it is it would have to be really bad for me for it to be worse than having a wedge and dealing with all that extra sound on stage. Mm. That's, that's sort of how I think of it is, you know, yeah. Is it perfect? No. Would I, would I want to change the entire thing? <laughs> Definitely not. You know, yeah. I like going yeah, I, home I without my ears ringing. So. Uh, yeah. No, I get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, again, I, I'm, I'm an eight out of 10 these days, whereas before I was oh, that's amazing. Out of 10, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I use them every gig and in general, I'm getting what I want and it's a really good situation. I do have some guys who get louder over the course of the night and one guy who gets a lot louder to the point where it's, it's, uh, frustrating. Right. Interesting. Um, so when that happens, is Bill at the board bringing just the, the fader down for that person in the in the front of house, or the, is he bringing the gain for that person down because they're overloading the signal chain? Because if he's bringing the gain down, then that brings it down for you. Um, I I don't know the answer to that, and that's it's a it's a harder answer than that because sure through a gig a lot of things are happening, and my ability to get a remix halfway through a gig is dependent upon a lot of things where Bill physically is, and you know I, and I would, anything else that he's dealing with. I would recommend putting an iPad with your mix ready to go. That's, yeah, everybody has said that. Absolutely. On stage. Again, I, and I'm always by like, your amp, you know? Yep. That's, that's, that actually is what should happen. But I'm just so focused on fronting the band and, you know, not turning my back and, you know, doing that type of thing. But I mean, you're you right. could, you that, could that turn is, your back during, you know, a keyboard solo or, or, you know, a guitar solo that you're not playing. You know, a quick I little can't thing. I drink a beer, so I guess there's no reason I can't if, do that. If, if you can drink a beer, you can you can adjust your That's monitors. It. You can mix yourself. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Well That's, played. Actually, it was you played it. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like it. That's the best advice we've ever given on this show. I think. Yeah, if you can, if you drink, can drink a beer, a beer, you can mix yourself. Can mix your ears. <laughs> That's the title of the episode, unless something better happens. So I like it. Yeah. And one. I'll just, I'll just be okay. bitter that my beer drinking time has been eaten into by something that shouldn't have to happen. Well, but maybe you wouldn't need that sip of beer if uh, your mix was a little better. So, mm. ah, you know. No, that's not right. That's no, that's like, come on, we're musicians. Like, this is how this works. It's beer. It's beer. Yeah. I mean, what are we talking about here? Yeah. Um, one thing I will add, and I promise that before. For the next few weeks go by, uh, I will put a link, a, a page on the website listing all of the apps that would be good to have on your iPad in order to mix all of the boards that are out there. Because I have installed every app that I can find for every board, every Allen and Heath app, every, uh, you know, Mackie app, every... Behringer Midas app, you know, every personas app 
so that I have a high degree of likelihood if the if the engineer says, yeah, you can mix, but do you have the app? I ask, what mixer is it? Because if I just say yes, then they won't believe me, even though it's probably true. You know, I'll say, which mixer is it? They'll say, oh, it's the Allen and Heat, this one or whatever. I'll be, yep, I got that app. Great. Is this the, and I, and I will say the name of the app to them. We'll be like, oh, okay, what about this one? And, you know, I'll, it is not uncommon for the mixer to have Wi-Fi, but not internet access. A lot of engineers do not like to have their mixers uh, having access to the internet because then firmware updates might happen automatically. And, you know, there's security issues and all that stuff. So oftentimes it is a closed off network. It's an isolated network. So just because you get their Wi-Fi doesn't mean that you're going to be able to download an app. You might just be able to connect to the mixer. Um, of course, you could probably tether to your phone if you needed to and all that. But if you take 20 minutes before you go to a gig and just load everything up on your on your iPad or your phone, even your phone, you know, it makes life a lot easier. So I, I will make a list of those and and then... If you have, like, tell us what apps you you use, and I'll make sure they're on the list, too. Feedback at gigabpodcast.com. I promise I'll do this. All right. You want to talk about this thing about your band having success, Paul? Well, it's not so much about my band. It's more well, like I mean, an observation. It, our bands in general. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah. You, your band, the, the, the Royal We. The Royal band. Your. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was just thinking about uh, bands I know and... and um, you know, bands of levels of success and what keeps a band from breaking through to another level. And again, we've defined this many times. A, a level can be better pay. It could be better audiences. It could be better treatment of your band, whatever your definition of, of next level is. I mean, I, I always think always about, you know, all right, what's next? You know, what, what can we do better? And it's usually a combination of all those things. Like, are we going to raise our rates? Uh, and say no to gigs who don't do that? Are we going to uh, only go into rooms or venues that are great? Are we going to, you know, like in the last couple of years, we started doing these ticketed gigs, which have ended up being great gigs, great, great fan base, great paydays, great, um, uh, great for our reputation as a band that can sell four or 500 tickets, you know, a couple times a year. Uh, you know, that, that kind of gives a little mystique to the band and, and justifies our asking costs for private gigs often. Sure. So I've been thinking about what makes, what, what is good and you know, what, it, how about you, your band does, is, is your band stuck at a certain level and it's frustrating? Um, and you know, how do you get yourself up to these next levels, whatever that might mean to you? Yeah. And we talked about it at the top of the show, you know, certainly, you know, having band members who all want to go to whatever that next level is, is, is foundational to it. Right. Does everybody want to do what it takes to make more money? Does everybody want to do what it takes, you know, to get into better rooms or, you know, whatever it may be. So having your business mate on the same page, I think is a good thing, but you know what I think actually is probably the, the biggest thing is like you treat people how to teach you teach people how to treat you. And I think, daring to go to another level going after bigger better gigs i think that that's a that's a like i know a lot of bands that are good bands that take kind of like okay play in the corner of a restaurant you know gigs and always you know like i get a calls from other bands but hey you know if you do this outside gig can we open for you we want to get into that market sure and it's like you don't need to open for me you know just go after that business you got a good band go after it it's if you don't see yourself as worthy of, of a, a certain level of success i think that's something that holds you back as any endeavor in life but certainly applies to band progress and band growth you agree i do agree i mean yeah I, I we talk about this on the small business show at businessshow.co uh, often where what we say is the the biggest the most common thing that impedes my success is me mm. and 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 what you're saying feeds right into that it's like you know if you don't if you don't see yourself as being at that level then you're not at that level like it, no one else will see you there and if they do, and they will occasionally, you will have these moments in life, right, where whatever you are doing, someone will see something in you or in your business or your band or whatever it is that you don't at the moment, right? And 
they will come to you and offer you a thing. You might not even notice that they are offering you this thing because you're unable to see it. And so really being aware of, you know, what does it feel like to be at that next level? What does that look like is huge. And it's really, really hard to do that. It's hard to visualize something that you have not experienced, right? I mean, it, it you know, it's it's a chicken and egg almost, but you can. Well, but the flip side of that is. You can do it. Really yeah. interesting. Well, the thing is, once you break through the ceiling of negative talk, yeah. of why you don't deserve something, all of a sudden you realize you can go after anything. I was guilty yes, of this. Yes, that's the key. I didn't. I, I, and I, I, didn't, I, I, I want you to say that again, because that's super, I, I'll, or I'll say it again. Once you break through, you realize you can do anything. That, like, th that's that's it right there. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. I mean, yeah I, I, I'll give a personal expression to this is I was super hesitant to go after certain gigs or ask for certain money with the house rockers. I didn't think I didn't think we dressed well enough. The bands that I saw getting the types of gigs I wanted were like really polished touring pros with, you know, perfect costumes and, you know, all this type of stuff. And they were getting these really, you know, high end, you know, a lot of corporate gigs and, you know, really high end, you know, paying gigs. Sure. And I was like, you know, you know my guys don't want to do that. So, you know, we're not going to be that type of band, but I really wanted to be that type of band. And I really wanted, you know, we did work hard and I did want, I did want to see the guys get paid for stuff, but I felt personal limitations about asking for that. Yep. Once I wrap my head around, like, this is my product, you know, we're not perfect in all ways. We're really damn good in many ways. And the other thing, we're just going to let it, let it be what it is, but it didn't really matter. I was going to let the market tell me instead of me telling me. So I started going out and asking for good gigs and raised our price. And do we get everything? Nope. We're, we know we're not a great wedding band for some of these reasons. Sure. Um, we don't fit in a lot of places as a 10 piece band. We don't, we're not really great at dressing up for weddings. Um, you know, uh, our repertoire is not for, you know, people in their twenties getting married often. Oh, you know, it could be, but, and, and your but band, anyway. your band is a band about the house rockers, not about the bride and groom. Right. Right. So, you know, and there's what, nothing what, what wrong with, do I don't yet, say that as a I, negative. I know I, yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. We built a brand, we've built Correct. a style, we've built something. But the point of it all is once I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the one to stand in the way of, of bigger things because of my preconceived notion about what it takes to be there. We have a good band. We play well, you know, we're good guys. We entertain people seem to be happy when they come to see us. I need to get out of my own way. And I just started asking for bigger. I don't get everything, but we have moved up tremendously. And, and, um, we do get better paydays than we used to get than we used to get before, once I removed my own personal shackles of, of going after these types of things. Dude, dude, you when said we, you did when, it again. That phrase, I need to get out of my own way. <laughs> I can't like I have verbatim. I have said that to myself so many times in my life. And sometimes I've listened to myself. Most of the time I don't most of the, it's really hard to listen to that. Right. But that phrase, I need to get out of my own way. If we all say that every freaking morning when we wake up, it's going to be a different year for all of us. I Absolutely. guarantee. And, you know, this is, this assumes you're doing the work of the stuff you can control. Yes. Well rehearsed band. Yeah. You know, you don't make mistakes. You play in tune. You know, you don't, you know, insult, insult people when you, you know, like, like the basic <laughs> things. The things that we had to learn the hard way is what you're saying. The hard way. Yeah. But, you know, again, go after the gigs and yeah. keep going after them and be professional about it. And if you get told no, ask why, you know, be businesslike about it. And, uh, you know, decide if the why is something you can put up with or not, or go look elsewhere for the good gigs, yep. you know, charge, you know, you know, basically what the, the scale is in where you are as to what's possible. Right. If you're at the bottom of the scale because of your own fear, that's your fault. Um, and if, if you keep trying to get the top of the scale and you don't get it, there's something to learn there and you figure out what you're going to do about it. Right. Yeah. You know, if you're a four piece band, and, you know, you're expecting to get a thousand bucks a guy every single night you go out, you know, and you don't get it. The market may be telling you what, what's real, but it's not for lack of trying. It's not for lack of asking. So I, I do think that this is a big thing. You know, so many people in bands are a not business people. They're artists um, they're, and, and the financial things make them uncomfortable. 
they they love the playing, but the you know the the transacting the business is intimidating. Often. Say say that again. Um, I, I you, or you, you cut off the, the 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 business side of it is. Did you say intimidating? Is that right? Intimidating. Yeah, yeah the financial side of things can be intimidating. Yeah, for sure. But I just want to say, like, I, I know I know several bands that are like I said, they're playing in the corner of a restaurant and they're happy doing that, but they want more. And when I ask them, you know. Why don't you go after that? You know, you're a good enough band for that. They're like, oh, they wouldn't want a three piece or, you know, oh, you know, we're not this, that. Let them tell you that. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> don't that put words it. in their mouth before you've let them speak. Yeah. <laughs> that is it. Yeah. At the end of the day, if you make people happy with your music, you are, you are sellable. You are bookable. You will be meaningful to somebody. Yeah. And uh, you entertain. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like it's not even. I wouldn't even put it as specific as making them happy with your music, though that it might be an obvious correlation. But it's can you entertain? That's it. That That's it. That's what you need to do. Can you entertain? If so, great. Go do that. That's it. Believe in it. Yep. Man, powerful stuff. What are we, some kind of self-help show here? This is great, man. That's what we, that's what we started with, right? Yeah, it's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, I don't know that I have, I can't top that, man. That's, uh, that's Paul Kent there laying down the wisdom folks. What is it? What do you, what do you always say? Three chords and the truth. Three chords and the truth. That's it. Today. We didn't even play three chords. We just, we just th thus spake the truth. Spaketh. You must be Zarathustra, right? <laughs> right. Isn't that the name of the song uh, that we know as the theme from 2001? Thus spake yep. Zarathustra, right? Or, or the, the, I, I believe the, 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 na the original name was uh, also Sprach Zarathustra or something that I'm completely mispronouncing, but you know, there you go. You're way down the rabbit hole. Way down the rabbit hole, Paul. Way. I mean, it's, you know, I just came from band rehearsal. You're, you're happy there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, this is the rabbit hole is where I live, man. <laughs> We've met, right? Uh, <sighs> yeah. I don't know that I don't have anything else. I don't know. Do you have anything else? I don't. Just get your butt off off your butt and go out and get better gigs. Get your butt off your butt. Go get the gigs. That's it. That's what I got. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Always be performing. Always. Yeah, especially when you're selling your band. That might be the most important performance. One of them. Pretend you're someone else. Pretend you're a master salesperson when you're out there selling your band. Eventually, it'll be true. That's true.